Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Small Data with T, where we are passionate about the power of small data in healthcare. I am your host, Tanasia Gonzalez, but you can call me T. Data has certainly changed the game in healthcare. Big data has blown the roof off, but small data, now that's the future. Small data allows us to dive deep into the key insights and take quick, customized action to achieve phenomenal results in performance and quality improvement. Let's explore this today. Thanks so much for joining us. If you have any questions for me or any of my guests, feel free to reach out to me at tgonzalez at eima inccom Enjoy the show. Let's go. In season four, our topic is healthcare data analytics as a career. I spoke with some folks who are new to the field or thinking about joining in. I also spoke with some seasoned professionals and learned from their insights and suggestions for those who are beginners. I hope you find these conversations as enjoyable and informative as I did. More importantly, I hope they help you in your journey. I am so happy to share with you my conversation with Beth Bauer. Beth and I met at the Data Universe Conference that was held recently in New York City at the Jacob Javits Center. And the Data Universe was definitely a, a place where data enthusiasts came together and IT enthusiasts came together. And the energy was very high. So was happy to have met Beth um, and hear a little bit about her background and make that connection. On this talk, she discusses her journey from aspiring psychiatrist to data enthusiast, emphasizing the importance of using data to solve real world problems. Beth works at the intersection of big data, business, and people, and she has over 35 years of experience in advanced analytics. She shares her experience in healthcare data and the pharmaceutical industry highlighting personalized medicine and the significance of belief systems in trust and health outcomes. And I'm so happy to share this conversation with you. I have learned so much from Beth. I'm so happy to be connected with her. And I hope you enjoy this conversation. More importantly, I hope you hear something that will help you along your journey. Thanks so much, T, for inviting me to Let's Talk Small Data with T. Thank uh, you for I'm coming. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm yeah. so excited to have met you recently at the Data Universe Conference. Data right? Universe Conference. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So just- um, my background is, uh, you know, it's it's fascinating because I originally wanted to be a psychiatrist. And then I discovered data. And I also discovered that I did n- not want to do the practice of psychiatry, but <laughs> there w- I continued down the pathway of psychology and uh-huh. communication. But man, I needed that hard look at decision making within that yeah. space. And data just did that for me. And I was blessed to have worked at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation okay. Uh I only stayed a short time because it it turned out that I needed I needed to to expand faster than that environment could do for me, right. but it exposed me to how much data there is and we need to track in healthcare. Yes, and that led me into a pathway to work with one of the world's largest data as a product providers. So. Love that it. was working all things data, big and small, mm-hmm. because even when you're working in big data, <laughs> it still needs to be actioned on sometimes in small spaces, right? Amen. And, in, and in everyday <laughs> activities and daily habits that people have. Yes. And so I got to work in the um, industry that supports the pharmaceutical industry from a data perspective of how do you begin to identify new diseases? How do you begin to identify who would benefit by having solutions in new diseases? How do you get a message out to the population in Mm -hmm. an innovative state? Um, Just super fun work, always doing the same type of work, but always for a new application, solving people's problems. And being able to use data to solve people's problems just 
ended up creating a life's passion for me. <laughs> so yeah. blessed then with getting to actually do that, both making the product and mm -hmm. then moving into the industry that actually used that product. So um, the beautiful part of that was that being my own customer, mm -hmm. oh, you get to see a whole new lens, right? Because now this is how do you take actions mm -hmm. on data that's being created right. and realizing that data that isn't tied to actions or at least insights that can become actionable. Right. Well, it's just, well, I used to call that data vomit. <laughs> too, <laughs> much, too much data that actually isn't tied to anything. You can begin to get lost. Right. Right. And that's I a think technical that, term, right? Data vomit. Okay. I'm going to start using that. It yeah. is a technical term, exactly. <laughs> um, but that allowed me to then actually take what I learned from the customer side mm -hmm. to come back in as the data product side and build out for a whole new set of industry because now I got to do that, not just for the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry, but the pharmacy industry. Okay. And that was another fascinating transition because- in the pharmaceutical industry, initially, we were always looking at customers through a particular therapeutic lens. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, people, customers are holistic. And the for the same space of mm -hmm. pharmaceutical product, the pharmacy industry actually looked at patients more holistically. Yeah. Right. They needed to be able to pay attention to multiple therapeutic areas and where they are in the journey. They also had the ability to actually have a one on one re personal relationship with people who were using these products, which, again, yeah. gives you a whole other yeah. set of insights, as well as continuity of of right. what's happening throughout that customer journey, which is yeah. a human journey. Right. Yeah. So. That led me to like, oh my gosh, look what could be done with data if we just start looking at it through a different lens. And back into the pharmaceutical uh, space, as, you know, from a, uh, a pharmaceutical manufacturer, mm -hmm. to start thinking about how can we begin to leverage all the insights that we have mm -hmm. to really start making a dent in improving the health of people. And to do that in a way that is transparent. Uh -huh. and can uh, share the insights of what we know, the honesty of what we don't know, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Because this is another, like I see all these issues today with science yeah. uh, and people saying things like, well, you don't know that this is a fact on a particular science topic. And the answer is we know that contextualized a particular stimulus versus response is connected but we don't always know the entirety of the ecosystem that's influencing it. Very and being honest about, mm -hmm. here's what we know, mm -hmm. and it's just pieces of the totality, and there's a whole bunch we don't know. And I think we're not used as, as scientists to be willing to say, you know what, I don't know everything. Right. <laughs> right? No, that's extremely interesting. Yeah, and I love what you were saying about the journey. Like we're developing these therapies mm -hmm. to solve problems and make people's lives better, right? Like, but what's the real experience at the person level? Exactly. The, li and the lived you, experience. Yeah. The lived experience, you know, how are these therapies really impacting you? And are they bringing about the outcomes that we're trying to bring about? And what's the road like? Is it bumpy? Is it impossible? Are the side effects so impossible that it's just, it's prohibitive at this point? Like, like where do you collect those data, you know, along the journey? So I love when you started speaking about the pharmacy role as opposed to the pharmaceutical role. So the pharmacy, the pharmacist is a little closer to the individual and capturing so, um, um, the experience. Exactly. And being able to take the insights from pharmacy, from providers, 
and from patients and mm-hmm. to start to bring that together in a shared decision making right. yeah. because the science of today and I'm so happy that you picked you know what you just said regarding what people experience in a healthcare journey mm-hmm. because side effects some of the specific issues around side effects can mm-hmm. be um genetically um driven Mm. and and in some cases can be community driven and these insights are not necessarily making that out to all of the pharmacy and medical providers in Mm -hmm. a way that it's top of mind Mm -hmm. for them to account for that in someone's journey so Mm -hmm. having a means through which we can bring up key insights that the individual humans can Mm -hmm. then use as part of changing and leveraging that journey is Mm going to be key, right? And this is where we're all talking about AI and its role in healthcare, et cetera. But it's not just the AI. It's just being able to point to um, some of the nuances that we've got data, that data vomit again, there's data everywhere, but it has to actually be harnessed in a way that people can use it. Right. Right. It's there, but the right information at the right time. Yeah, exactly. And in my mind, I'm also thinking like, I always think about the power of the HIE and Mm. where that could be very powerful. There are many challenges with that, but I know that the HIE has access to different healthcare organizations, including pharmacies and pharmaceutical groups, as well as clients on this end. Wouldn't it be great if you could hear directly from the individuals? Here's my experience. I know there are some things and processes you have to put in place and and filters and whatnot for them to speak and work closely with their PCP, a primary care provider along the pharmaceutical journey, but wouldn't it be great to hear directly from Mrs. Jones, you know, like this medication makes me sick on Tuesdays and Thursdays because of X, Y, Z, or this is against my religious belief, or I can't really take this medication because I don't know, some other factor, but wouldn't it be nice? I mean, then once you get all of that information, how do you assimilate it and, and apply it and do something with it? So more issues, but I get excited with the the idea of that loop, having that loop available, constantly flowing, so people could learn and know and adapt and change and improve over time. So, sorry I interrupted you there, but I just needed to. No, I got so excited because I heard this term recently at a at a conference um, from a patient advocacy mm-hmm. group that uh, just ties in so impactfully with what you just said. Mm-hmm that the answer to a lot of our health equity issues is truly personalized medicine. Oh yeah. And that personalized medicine incorporates the totality of things that you just listed, Mm -hmm. which it's, it's a combination of who you are chemically and, and physically what your lived experiences are and your belief systems that a solution, even into chemically medically identical people, the solution may be different because yeah. of their beliefs. And, and we have to account for that, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? And still find pathways to, to solving for people whose belief systems don't necessarily accept some mm-hmm. of the solutions that we're providing, right? Yes, yes, totally agree with that, yeah. And sharing some of those insights. So this was the other key, uh, what's driving me for the future is having worked with, um, some of the largest health data information out there that Mm -hmm. so commercial (laughs) tends to have a lot of data that isn't necessarily accessible to everyone else. Yeah. Um, And being able to take those insights that come through the commercial channels Mm -hmm. and get them out so that they actually impact health, I think is this is the secret sauce to our, the future of health. We need to be able to, pull those insights out and get them shared in a way that we're looking to win, win, win situation. So totally. one that I was exposed to in my work, uh, probably about eight years ago, mm-hmm. uh, was the concept of medication adherence. Oh, yeah. And 
the Affordable Care Act implemented uh, some components where uh, insurers uh, were required to hit certain levels of medication adherence with Medicare patients. Yes. And what was interesting in looking at this is realizing, huh, when you dig into this data, it actually turns out that surprise, when patients take medications, they actually get better. <laughs> and there's less cost to their care. And so the drive to say, you know, create barriers to taking medications, you realize that you're actually hurting yourself as someone who's a payer, for example, because mm -hmm. you make more money by making people healthy, not by making them sicker. Um, and you find that obviously there are clinical trials that actually explain mm -hmm. what a dosing regimen should be and what's actually going to be effective. And right. so if you're not hitting those dosing levels and, and taking your medicine every day, you're not getting the benefit that is expected, but you are taking in something that potentially does have some form of side effects. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be great if you could actually get the benefit right. that has been scientifically identified? When that happens, you get win-win. The patient gets better. The doctors who participate in accountable care organizations right. um, their patients do better. You end up spending less on the overall patients. The insurers do better. Mm -hmm. Win, 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 win. Healthier people reduces burden on our overall healthcare system. I think that actually gets at the heart. The underlying part of that is really, do you trust? Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, we have to trust. And gosh, today, <laughs> we, we've got trust breaking down all over the place. Oh, I yeah. mean, trust is even breaking down within families, which is really frightening. Mm -hmm. um, trust is breaking down within local communities, right? People, you know, the others, whoever the others are. Um, and I really, I, I honestly believe that using data in a, in a more informed way mm -hmm. can actually help us to begin to break down those barriers that are that are eroding trust. And mm -hmm. part of that, you know, where we started in the conversation is accepting that, you know, science doesn't know everything. Right. Um, it it and how, you know, how much do we know being honest about that in healthcare? If I go back to like my grandmother's time, she had gotten cancer and nobody told her. <laughs> you know, like, uh. and maybe there are still people today who follow those practices, but yeah. it should be a, a choice about that, right? right. I would right. like to know and be informed about my medical future, or I'd like somebody else to handle it, just fix it all for me, or don't, or you know, I don't want to know. But that's a personal choice too, right? Empower, empower um, the patient to be an active exactly. partner and make those decisions. Yeah, right, right. And and having them then provide both their trust mm -hmm. and potentially behaviors because related to how how much you trust, mm -hmm. you may actually put in different behaviors that either promote mm -hmm. or sabotage what's going to happen next. And it may be unconscious. Yes. Right. And whether this is yes. medicine or your work, it really doesn't matter. Everything. Those underlying <laughs> subconscious things actually can right. end up affecting it. And hey. so yes. creating community, right? Community yeah. who will help support you in your decision making, mm -hmm. whether we're talking medicine or or mm -hmm. commercial, actually, mm -hmm. uh, is very, very helpful, particularly if you're going into unknown spaces to you. Yeah. Right. Because change and 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 belief shifting is really hard for all of us. It doesn't totally. matter the topic. And so creating a community of support mm -hmm. who you can actually weigh the new data mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Right. What does this data say to you? Um, and right. recognizing where perhaps your personal limitations are with a mm -hmm. with data, right? This yeah. is one of the things that I see with people is like data comes in and they, they either just accept it or deny it. Right. But at the end of the day, most situations, there's elements of truth and elements of contextualization. Mm -hmm. And so I don't mean that they're untruths. It's just that it's in such a small space that mm -hmm. it may not be actually telling the full story. 
And so being able to understand those nuances is again, data people, we're used to digging into that. Where did this come from? Where's your source? How did you get this information? What can we, um, what is specific to this study versus generalizable to the world? All of those things potentially need to be answered depending on the decisions that people are making. And sometimes you need help. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> In fact, you almost always need help. Always. Some form of help, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, Whether it's in the subject or in handling the data. Yeah, no, totally. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, okay, yeah, we have all of this data. I, I love being able to see the data, but taking deliberate action with the data, really having in mind what the outcomes you're looking for are. And mm-hmm. if those outcomes don't happen, really digging into the data and letting it answer for you, why? And if not, tell me, what do I need to change? What do I need to, how do I need to pivot? You know, what else do we need to do in order to get to these outcomes we're looking to get to? Um, And, you know, bringing together the whole village (laughs) to take a holistic view and get everyone's perspective and really make sure you touch every point of that journey for that individual so that you're taking into account everything. The beliefs that may have been programmed from childhood I mean, there's early childhood oh, right. trauma that may have set people up in a certain way that if that's not dealt with, doesn't matter what you're doing down you're, here. You're going to exactly. be pushing up against, uh, you know, uh, a brick wall. Um, but yeah, so sorry, I cut well, you off. So go ahead, I, I, no, I, I love that. And actually, uh, I, I've spent like the last two years <laughs> coming up with uh a series of strategies that actually mm-hmm. address exactly what you've just said. Um, I call it being adept at innovation. Okay. And there's really two sides to it, which is really the human thinking and the data thinking. Oh. Um, okay. And it starts with that, you know, you're going to be doing some analytics, mm-hmm. but your analytics actually also need strategic thinking because if you've always been doing your analytics in exactly the same way, the world can come back and bite you because the world changes, the analytics change, and you may not have been able to to see something. Then there's the acuity, which just happens to be an A word that means insights. (laughs) And so how do you get the insights? That's the human side. You have to have taken these analytics Mm -hmm. and then contextualize them to and the synthesis that you were talking about. What Mm -hmm. does this really mean to us? Right. That ties to the decision-making from those humans. What actual decisions do we need to be making from this? And then is our data fit for purpose to that decision? Right. Now, let's say you get that far. You need to then start thinking about, well, how does this change our world and what we want to do? Who do we need to engage Right. Because engaging people in how would this change your view of the world? How would you use this to do something differently and then create enabling technologies and and people process technology? Right. Right. Which has always been there, but now it's combined with the rest that needs to make it smooth. It needs Mm. to make it easy. It needs to make it a no brainer that we want to take on this new innovation because it's going to solve problems for us. Yes. All of that is anchored in trust. Wow. Right. So we had 10 different components, uh-huh. analytics, security, decisions, data, enablement, uh, engagement, people, process, technology, trust. Without the totality of that, mm. it's really hard to get people to want to innovate. Change is hard. Behavior uh-huh. changing is hard. Even when you see incredible uh, potential in mm. front of you, it needs uh-huh. to be why is that going to be worth it to me? Yeah. Um, I can almost visualize almost a, uh, a, a check sheet or a checklist <laughs> to make sure that you've addressed each of those 10 things and how, you know, and really document and make sure that you're touching on everything so that nothing's missed. And then, you know, as you're gathering your data, when you're going along with your actions and you're tracking your KPIs, whatever they are, 
that you've come up with to really track, you know, how you're doing along the course, um, then you have that documentation to come back to and go, okay, so on the one of the 10, maybe we should tweak it this way. Maybe doing this is not really working or doing this is working really well because we see that across a thousand of these incidents. Um, but yeah, that's very interesting. I love that. Um, I love how you just went with that because spot on feedback. Yes, the loop. Empathy, empathy in that feedback. Yes. Accountability. Mm -hmm. And accountability, a lot of people look at accountability like um, this is something I'm going to like hold your neck up on. No. The police. Right. About, it's it, right. <laughs> the police. The exactly. KPI police. No, it's right. about. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> exactly. But it's about actually having people engage because right. when people are engaged, they have accountability. You don't have to ha tell them to have it. They own it. And right. that's exactly what you want. So you create high performing teams who want to see all of this succeed and they see their role in it mm -hmm. because they see that they play a key part in being able to create your goals, strategies, and decisions for getting stuff done. It's all GSD, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Goal strategies and decisions for getting stuff done. Um, and and if without that feedback loop, and people think of feedback as only one thing, like I'm going to have a one-on-one -on -one difficult conversation with you. And it can be that, but it can be as simple as having those processes or mm -hmm. uh, let me remove that word process because it makes a lot of people shudder. Habits, yeah. habits that actually people have to get the feedback and they can be, exactly. they can be formalized in a way that you ensure that it doesn't hurt. Because as soon right. as you ask somebody, I find this all the time in analytics, um, there's a lot of assumptions that get made. Someone gets told to do something, mm -hmm. uh, head down a particular pathway on a project. They may not want to seem dumb. And so they don't ask enough questions and they end up actually making a ton of decisions themselves mm -hmm. that never get articulated. Mm -hmm. And if no one looks under the covers of, of some of that work, it can mm -hmm. be that people went down a wrong pathway. Off and you can rails. end up with yeah. some off the rails. Mm -hmm. And they didn't mean to go off the rails. They just didn't know. And so right. by automatically creating, I call them peer reviews mm -hmm. in, in those habits where it's just normal that I'm going to have somebody look at my stuff. Somebody yeah. who thinks differently than I do, who can actually put eyes on this and say, hey, did you did you know you made a decision here? Actually, you put a filter yeah. on or you you contextualize it to just this one little space when really our problem is a bigger space. Like right, right. having someone walk you through that critical thinking mm -hmm. of what you've created allows it to actually be the, at the beginning of your mm -hmm journey in in this knowledge journey you're able to receive the feedback that allows you to make your product bigger better yeah right yeah. rather than finding out at the end right yeah i was That's just gonna cool. say when you first oh. start that journey people yeah. are very um defensive uncomfortable under uncomfortable, very defensive, uncomfortable like oh boy oh yeah but right there this is this you're you're doing this because this is a way to get me fired Mm. but it's actually the opposite right because yeah. as you go through this it creates a means where you you and your reviewers go mm. on a journey together right. and you may end up sharing knowledge that, that you would never have talked about if you didn't go through that process totally I mean if you right? treat it like a team building exercise right and a way to strengthen the team and when you meet and, and constantly communicate their psychological safety here. Um, we want you to exactly. share, this is not punitive. This is to just dot all the I's and cross all the T's and 
doing these types of activities will make us stronger and better as a unit. Um, so and allow us all to grow because right. some of the things that come out of that, right, are you may find that uh, you know there's something new that was learned by maybe right. the person who was conducting. And when you see that this new thing, this thing was new for one person, you can then realize, hey, if this one person didn't know this, probably there's a lot more people who right, didn't know this. Right. And so it actually identifies new training or mm -hmm. new um, insight sharing that needs to be given out to a larger population, right. right? Of critical things that a lot of people may have assumed was mm -hmm. known, but isn't. Totally. And some best practices that folks oh, exactly. do not know about. And you can share those as well. I always love when that happens. Um, I do love a good best practice. <laughs> no, totally. Totally. I'm right there with you. I, and where I absolutely like apply data and analytics to pr pretty much every aspect of my life, it's not the outcome. It's the tool. Mm. Right. It is always not doing it for the sake of doing it. It's mm -hmm. doing it for the sake of improving something. Yeah, for sure. And and, and that's the piece that people really re need to remember as, yeah. as we begin to build out more. There's so much data vomit around and people yeah. are starting to put energies to all these various places, creating right, a right. ton of churn. But where did you actually need to put that energy? which causes you to think back to what are, what are your goals personally for your organization, for your community, for your um, local government organization, right? Being able mm -hmm. to figure out what those goals are and then put right. the energies to, and, and hearing the totality of those goals across the continuum yeah. so that you can build some foundations that will address them all eventually, right. but perhaps at different time intervals, right? Definitely. Which allows people to actually see value today mm -hmm. while building the value of tomorrow, right? Yeah. That's what, when you get at the KPIs and things like that, obviously I love KPIs, OKRs, all of it. Um, but when there's only one without balance yeah. for what that impact yeah. would be into, tom or right. into tomorrow, Right. We end up again going off the rails, right? It becomes right. unbalanced the the systems that we're talking to. So being able to have those honest conversations with mm -hmm. people about, you know, so what are you going to do with this? And what happens when you hit this goal? And what if it actually ends up impacting this other thing over here? Mm -hmm. And how do we want right. to how do we want to make sure that we don't end up with negative outcomes on something else? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that adept concept actually leads itself to that because you need to have been thinking through that acuity into, uh -huh. well, what do all these decisions and data and analytics really mean today and right. tomorrow? Um, so, so I love that example because mm -hmm. again, back to that medication adherence space, yeah. uh, when looking at it from a pharmacy perspective and diving into data, while I didn't have any information on the human touch, what I could see clearly, mm -hmm. repeatedly, uh, systematically, is that patients who were new to a therapy mm -hmm. were significantly more non-adherent than patients who had been on medication for a while. Mm -hmm. And it almost didn't matter whether it was this medication or any medication. The concept that you needed to be on a chronic drug for the rest of your life was really a big barrier for people to get over. Yeah. And so the hand-holding and human touch, and oh, by the way, taking into account all the side effects and all the other things that we've talked about, mm -hmm. it requires a lot more hand-holding in that scenario than potentially someone who's new to this therapy, but mm -hmm. has been on other therapies or has been continuing on a therapy and doing fine. And, oh. and so an interesting uh, component on this is in the pharmacy space, you know, national retailer level, um, they had one team who was, their job is to get in new patients. And you have mm -hmm. another team whose job is to make sure that they're being adherent. 
But these two goals were actually in conflict because new patients would actually be for it adherence. And so being able to tease that out and say, mm -hmm. we need to treat these populations potentially differently yeah. and and subset the metrics you know once once we have you stabilized now we can talk about adherence right. i do want to address the one other thing on the digital twin because uh it's fascinating i've been using digital twins since before there was a name for digital twins we, okay. <laughs> we called it synthetic data we also mm. called it just test data Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we had to just make that data up ourselves to be mm -hmm. able to do all of that. And a um, couple of key things, very powerful tool, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, for so many aspects. I fear, however, that people begin to believe that they that's a one and done. I make my mm -hmm. digital twin and now I'm set. And the problem is we learn things about the world. Mm -hmm. And we need to take in new information and the world changes. And yeah. so if you don't actually update your digital twin synthetic data, testing data what, to incorporate mm -hmm. the new realities, you can end up going down some really bad pathways. It needs to be adaptive, right? Exactly. Um, but we're coming down to the end of the talk and I want to make sure that we get to data jam uh, before we come to an end. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So there's actually there's 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 three aspects to what I'm working on. Data Jam is a key uh, okay. component of that. That my main goal is mm -hmm. to get more people, all people, leveraging mm -hmm. data in their daily lives, daily work, uh, and and to be able to help us move forward both in trust mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. able to take on innovations because innovation is everything these days, right? The world is yes. changing so fast. So the Data Jam is a program that's been around for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I am now the vice president and on the board of that organization. Yes. It started out of a, a public-private partnership with the University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon University, and people who worked at IBM and PPG. Mm -hmm. um, it has now evolved and it's growing from Pittsburgh, which is where that originally kicked off, to nationally. Uh, there are teams in San Francisco, San Diego, New York, New Jersey, uh, Boston, wow. and Jordan um, was our fir first time this year, which is super exciting. Wow. And the key here is that we're creating a, a multi-layered mentorship with university students who get mm -hmm. trained to talk with diverse communities, marginalized mm -hmm. communities, who then uh, partner with high school teams who wow. compete in a in a data analytic conference. Oh and the that. super great thing mm -hmm. is they get to pick the topic. So okay. their passions get to come through in what they're trying to analyze. Uh -huh. And they uh, go through a, a program that allows them to find data uh -huh. that's available uh -huh. that can help support what they're trying to understand in their worlds. Wow. The skills that people come out with in this is just out of this world. Um, we have professional uh, data scientists from various spaces mm -hmm. come as judges and new judges every year just say, oh my gosh, I would never have been able to do this in high school. I can't yeah. believe what these students are capable of. So that's just oh, super exciting. Yeah, um, I love that. If I anyone that. is interested in the Data Jam, the datajam.org, mm -hmm. uh, that would be fantastic. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share is a, an organization that's actually just starting out in partnership with Carnegie Mellon University and, and their CREATE Lab, uh, which stands for Community Robotics Education and Technology Empowerment. Uh, that organization, CREATE Lab, has been around for about 10 years as well. It is a uh -huh. nonprofit that has realized that for innovation to take hold, we have to walk people through the journey. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> right? And so, and, and they're doing that at a local level. Uh -huh. So we're taking initially health insights, but it uh -huh. will be for helping people with health and wealth, because these are so inexplicably tied. Yes. And, and leveraging data and human connection in yeah. a network consultancy that okay. leverages an integrated knowledge system. Think of that as almost a marketplace of issues and potential solutions mm -hmm. that we're then bringing together with glue. 
and leveraging the best practices of communities mm -hmm. who've solved certain problems mm -hmm. and having them share that with the world, share their insights in a way that other communities who have similar problems yeah. can connect with them and leverage those best practices. So we can all be following some best oh, practices. I love it. Uh, so yeah. communities connected. I don't have a, a means to, um, we don't have a website up yet, but okay. the Create Lab at Carnegie Mellon definitely does. And so okay. uh, look out for that. And uh, I can't wait to see um, what comes of that. Yeah, I love that. All of that is so exciting. And definitely keep me in the loop. I would love to join you all in that journey. And I will definitely put some information in the notes of the show. Um, so folks can read along. And if folks want to reach out to you and get in touch with you, is that okay? And if yes, what's the best way to connect with you to learn more? Oh, 100%. So there's two avenues to do that. Mm -hmm. um, my company is actually Posiroi, P-O-S-I-R-O-I, -O -I, uh, which actually came from, I can't believe that people don't design how they want to do things in a way that almost will ensure that they get positive mm -hmm. ROI. <laughs> and, uh -huh. and that's the, right? A, a consultancy okay. that helps people leverage data in whatever their right. overall goals are. Posaroy.com has okay. a, a info button that people can connect with me or through mm -hmm. LinkedIn would be fine as well. Okay. Uh, it's actually my my handle on LinkedIn is Beth Bauer loves data and people. <laughs> I love that. I love <laughs> that. Yeah. Well, uh, Beth, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show and, and talking with me. I'd love to have you back again to talk uh, a little bit more about how your projects are doing and definitely meet some of those data jam folks and, and the kids working on the projects and everything or the young individuals, not kids. Um, yeah. This season of the podcast, I'm talking to a, a folks who are considering data analytics as a, in healthcare for the first time and really talking to some seasoned uh, individuals such as yourself and trying to bring the communities together uh, to connect. So I'm sure a lot of the folks that I've interviewed already will be very interested in learning more about what you're doing and would love to get in touch and see if they can join the party. Um, so this I am thrilled and I would love to introduce you to some young people who are already out in the working world who've been wow. through the Data Jam program, both as as high school students and yeah. as mentors and now as as functioning data scientists. That's oh quite a journey to walk through. Talk about the loop. I would love I would love to meet <laughs> those folks and have them on the show and just share my platform with them to really get their stories out there and just talk a little bit more and share their passions because this will inspire others, you know, um, to in what they want to do in their careers and purpose in life, so to speak. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you. That's the secret sauce tea. I can't thank you enough for having me. I'm so blessed to have gotten to know you and I, I can't wait to bring others to your show uh, and, and give it back. Thanks, Beth. Thanks so much.